All right, welcome to the uh, Gamecock Central podcast series. Um, on the phone, I have a gentleman, some of you probably know him as Consensus All-American. A lot of times people just say All-American, but I do want to add in that Consensus, as well as former professional wrestler, Mr. Dell Wilkes, a.k.a. The Trooper, a.k.a. The Patriot. Mr. Wilkes, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good, Chris. Hope you are. Oh, absolutely. I, I can't complain outside of everything else that's going on. Um, hope everything's going well for you and, and your family. And uh, in this, in these uncertain times that we're dealing with here, I appreciate you giving me the, giving me your time. Um, just, uh, guess, just to get started, just kind of catch us up on where uh, Mr. Dell Wilkes is today. Well, I, uh, I um, been working at Dick Smith Nissan. For the last 15 years, I'm in sales there, and uh, I am, I think probably the best thing that I can say is that I am Abigail and Garnet's papa, hey. and um, that's that's a good thing, too. Nice. And, uh, I, I'm fortunate that I've got three children, and um, as a result of those three children, I have two granddaughters. My oldest son, Robert, has a daughter, Garnet, and uh, obviously he's a Gamecock fan, him and his girlfriend. If it would have been a boy, it was going to be named Bryce, and uh, but it was a little girl, so they named her Garnet. And then my daughter Mally has a uh, daughter named Abigail, and Abigail's four. Matter of fact, I just uh, had Abigail for the last few days and took her back to, to see her mom and dad uh, this afternoon. So uh, I'm their papa, and that's good enough for me. Ah, well, that's great to hear. It's uh, I'm sure. Um... I'm sure they enjoy spending time with you, and it's not often that everybody has a uh, has a papa who has stories to tell like you do. Um, and speaking of stories to tell, I know we're going to probably get into a few of those today. Um, but first and foremost, um, you know, rather than kind of let things mix together, we definitely want to you know speak to our Gamecock fans out there as far as uh, the folks out there who maybe they don't know much about the type of football that went on in the '80s when you played. Um, and correct me on any of this if I am mistaken, but um, uh, you came from Irmo High School, is that correct? That is correct. I graduated oh. in 1980. Okay, so graduated in 1980. Um, before that, uh, from what I understand, you were a pretty big Gamecock fan um, just before you actually became a Gamecock. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, uh, I grew up around a bunch of Gamecocks. Now, in my household, my dad really wasn't a big sports fan. He didn't watch sports. He didn't follow sports. But his father and my dad's three brothers did. As a matter of fact, two of them graduated from the University of South Carolina. And uh, through them, but especially through my granddad, and I just developed the love of Gamecock football. He was almost an encyclopedia of knowledge of Gamecock athletics, as were my dad's three brothers. Funny, my dad was the only one that didn't follow it, didn't know anything about it. But through his brothers and his dad, I... Uh, I learned the history of Gamecock athletics from basketball and football and, and mainly football, but pretty much everything Gamecock I learned through them and they cultivated in me that love of, of the University of South Carolina athletics. So we hear a lot about um, football recruits um, these days, of course, with everything being scrutinized. Um, talk, if you don't mind, about recruiting at that stage. So I guess that would have probably put you a uh, you know senior in the high school in the late 70s, of course, with you graduating um, in 1980. Uh, what, what was recruiting like back then? And there's no internet, there's no cell phones. People relied primarily for what they saw in the paper or what they saw on TV, and then, of course, word of mouth. Just discuss your uh, recruitment at that time. Well, ob obviously, it was just much more simplistic. It was a much easier I, I think i think what the guys have to go through today and even the young girls the young ladies that are go to college to play sports it's just it's unbelievable but my microscope they're under and, and through social media and and all those outlets um they're always being watched and tracked and talked about but it was much simpler back then my recruitment started uh, I was born and raised in Columbia, and my dad moved our family to Georgia for five years from 1973 to 1978. After those five years, we moved back to Columbia. But when I was in the ninth grade at Calhoun High School in Calhoun, Georgia, I was in history class one day, and uh, I got a page that I needed to report to the high school football, head football coach's office, a guy named Buzzy McMillan. And uh, when I went to Coach McMillan's office, uh, 
there I met uh, a man from Clemson. And, uh, man, right now I'm drawing a blank. What's the guy's name? He works with us now at the University. Clyde Wren. Clyde Wren, yeah. Clyde was at, yeah, Clyde was at Clemson at the time. And uh, he had made it through um, Calhoun, Georgia. And he stopped in to see me and talked to me uh, about potentially a few years down the road playing football for the University of Clemson. And that made a huge impression on me that it, in the ninth grade, these people were already reaching out to me and contacting me. And then the contact continued through letters and, and, and magazines and phone calls and things like that. So it really was much more simplistic, just phone calls. And you're getting letters from people that attended the University of Clemson and graduated from Clemson. And then, of course, after that, followed other schools, Georgia, Georgia Tech, uh, most of the schools in the southeast, and, of course, South Carolina. And my junior year, the beginning of my junior year, is when we moved back to Columbia from Georgia, and we settled in Irmo. And then that's when it picked up with the University of South Carolina as far as in recruiting me and, of course, Jim Carlin. Now, the coach that recruited me uh, was Richard Bell. Uh, He was our defensive coordinator and linebackers coach. But uh, Coach Carlin was also very involved with it. And uh, so for me, through all that process, uh, starting in the ninth grade, I knew for certain I was going to play football in the state of South Carolina. I just wasn't sure which school it was going to be. Having been around all those Gamecocks growing up and developing that love for the University of South Carolina, it was still pretty pretty tough to overcome the fact that in the ninth grade, Clemson started pounding me pretty hard and keeping in contact with me, and that made quite an impression on me. And uh, I actually verbally committed. I took my official visit to Clemson, and um, that Saturday, I think they played Wake Forest, and the next morning I had breakfast with uh, Jimmy Laycock, who was the guy that was recruiting me at Clemson. He went on to become the head coach at William & Mary for about 30 years. And, of course, Danny Ford was the head coach. And the next morning, after that Saturday game against Wake Forest, I had breakfast with Coach Ford and Coach Laycock, and I was all in. I was going to be a Tiger. And um, stuck out my hand and said, look, guys, this is where I want to play. This is where I want to go to school. Uh, but eventually changed my mind and, and signed with the University of South Carolina, and I never regretted it. I uh, never looked back, never, 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 ever regretted one moment of going to South Carolina and playing for the Gamecocks. And that's uh, interesting. I know some folks out there are probably going to find that story, uh, especially with the um, the role that Clemson's on. Obviously, we don't want to spend too much time talking about them because this is a Gamecock uh, podcast, but, you know, it just seems like that those those kinds of stories – tend to repeat themselves. I know that was some uh, a situation that occurred also with, I think, uh, DeMario Jeffrey at one point, uh, who was also a, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was a Clemson commit, eventually played for South Carolina. So that's just something that kind of repeats itself time and time again. Um, so you finally, you commit to South Carolina. Um, they had a pretty good running back there at that time when you were playing. I think uh, you want to talk about playing with George Rogers maybe? Yeah, uh, the best college football player I've ever been on the field with, ever played with or against, is George. As a matter of fact, uh, we've had some great football players at the University of South Carolina, but I still think the greatest is George, uh, the only Heisman Trophy winner. But it was a phenomenal thing to be a part of. That was my freshman year. And I think the most amazing thing about it, or the thing that probably impressed me the most and still to this day has left an impression on me, and it wasn't what George did on the field. Uh, but it was amazing to watch him play. I, I, I would tell anybody that did not have a chance to see George play to go to YouTube and just look at some of the stuff. What an amazing running back, a big guy, strong, but also fast. and was just phenomenal in what he did. I think he finished his college career with 22 straight games of 100 yards or more with over 5,000 rushing yards in his college career. And that was all impressive. But the, the thing that left an impression on me with George was the way he handled it and the way he conducted himself. It was never about George. It was about the team. It was about those five guys on that offensive line in front of him that made it possible. And he always deferred to those guys, and he always included those guys in everything he did. Now, in 80, I was a backup. Uh, I was a backup guard uh, to Joe Doyle. And, uh, but uh, George always made sure that that offensive line and those guys up front uh, got the praise and got the recognition that uh, typically they don't get, and he made it about them. So to me, that was the most impressive thing about George and something I'm always grateful that I was a part of that, got to have a teammate as a Heisman Trophy winner. 
but just the way he handled it and conducted himself. And, and even to this day, I know he's very, very involved. He's never got um, never too busy to speak to anyone. Um, as a matter of fact, there was one time I was at Williams Bryce and the uh, elevator taking us up to the press box actually got stuck. So I can say that I was stuck on an elevator with George Rogers and he kept it very lively and uh, kept it positive and I wasn't scared, but I can't say that there weren't a couple of people on there who were slightly concerned, but uh, you know, even in, situa in situations like that, um, I can definitely see where you're coming from as far as just, you know, him just being kind of that, uh, that presence about him. Um, well, I, I dare anybody to find a picture, even if it was from 1980, 2000, 2010, 2015, find me a picture where George doesn't have that big grin on his face <laughs> where he's not showing all his teeth and just smiling. And that's the essence of George. And you talk about that Heisman trophy. Um, that's open to anybody. I mean, George will let people take that thing and, and, and take it to business functions and youth functions at their church. And even if George doesn't accompany it, George will, he's let teammates borrow it where they can take it and show it off. And he makes it a part of that group of guys. And, and uh, those guys that were on that 1980 team. So um, he's a special guy. He's been a great ambassador for the university, and I'm glad they've allowed him to do that. He deserves that. And just uh, at the time you were playing, um, you played under Carlin. Um, and Carlin, I don't want to necessarily say that, uh, you know, some folks loved him, some folks hate him, but at that time I think he was probably a better coach, in my opinion, than people gave him credit for. Um, what what was it like playing for Carlin, and what was just kind of the atmosphere surrounding him with, you know, just the folks who maybe were a little more critical of him than, say, he possibly deserved? Well, I, I agree with you. I think Coach Carlin was a far better coach than he gets credit for. And I think there are those out there that realize that, that understand that, that remember when he coached. Uh, he was a good recruiter. We had good talent here when Coach Carlin was the head coach. Uh, but Coach Carlin did have sort of an abrasive personality. Uh, I guess some people looked at it that way. He was a straightforward guy. He spoke his mind. Uh, he didn't mind saying what he felt, what he thought. And uh, a lot of people didn't like that. They didn't like that abrasiveness about him. Uh, but that was just his personality, just who he, who he was. And in the recruiting process, I appreciated that. It, it came across as genuine. It came across as real to me. And in the end, the reason I went to the University of South Carolina wasn't because I grew up in a Gamecock family and the influence of my uncle and my grandfather. The reason I went to the University of South Carolina was Jim Carlin. And I appreciated that, that honestness and that being up front and forthright with you. And uh, I thought he was a very solid football coach, had a good staff around him, uh, recruited very well. He had success everywhere he coached. If you look back at what he did at Texas Tech and what he did at West Virginia, uh, Coach Carlin was successful at every stop along the way. And um, he came in here. Back then, coaches, especially in a lot of your major football programs, your head coach was also your athletic director. Now, you know, that doesn't go on today, but he came in here and he was the head coach and athletic director. And he had some ideas that some people didn't like, and uh, he didn't mind expressing those ideas. And he had some battles with some of the people in the press and some of those on the board of trustees and even our president, James Holderman, at the time. They had a very open and public battle with each other. But uh, that was just Coach Carlin. He didn't mind. If he thought you were wrong, if he thought you needed to be called out, Jim Carlin didn't mind calling you out. He would wear that hat and do so proudly. But I enjoyed playing for him. He literally became almost a father figure to me in my later years after football and wrestling was done when I went through some pretty difficult situations in life. Coach Carlin was always there. He was always someone I could turn to, someone that I could count on for support and love and, and, and just never, ever turned his back on me. And he was that way for every young man that ever played for him. He, uh, Jim Carlin was your coach. He was always your coach. And you always felt like you could go to coach if you ever needed anything. And that meant quite a bit. Uh, that sounds, uh, sounds a lot like uh... – Frank Martin, um, the way you described him, I just had an opportunity to speak with a basketball player, a former basketball player for USC, and a lot of the same sentiments towards Frank Martin. So it seems like there's some uh, definite similarities um, as far as just, you know, that type of coach where they're, you know, they, they make sure that they hold you to a higher standard and hold you accountable. But at the end of the day, it seems to be that type of coach that folks gravitate towards once their careers are done, like you just explained. So that's a... Uh, 
that's some interesting insight to uh, Carlin because at, you know, at this stage, you don't really hear much about Carlin uh, anymore. I mean, folks do mention him from time to time, but of course, you know, the, a lot of the focus tends to be on the more recent success of the Gamecocks. Um, playing for Coach Carlin, I know um, what was going on with you at the time of, of Carlin's exit? Because well, I think at that time you had also quit football, if I'm not mistaken. Can you kind of walk me through the timeline there? Sure. It was um, after my sophomore year when I left the team. We went um, – that year was a pretty young team. Uh, we lost a lot of talent off that 1980 team. We we didn't only lose George Rogers, but we, we lost several starting offensive linemen. We lost several uh, seniors on defense that were key players. We lost a lot of key personnel and a lot of starters. So he's coming into 1981 with a relatively young team and an inexperienced team. We lost our quarterback. Gary Harper had started for two or three years under Jim. And, and so we're really just starting over with a lot of talent on both sides of the football. And uh, we went 6-6 six and six that year. We played a 12th game after the Clemson game. Uh, we went to Hawaii and played Hawaii. And uh, we got our brains beat out over there. And we came back and uh, finished up the year 6-6. Six and six. And then he was suddenly fired. I, I found out about it through um, – radio or TV, and, and this goes back to that feud, that longstanding feud that I referred to with him and Jim Holderman, who was the president of the university at the time. Uh, Coach Collin had Holderman figured out, and uh, there were a lot of things going on behind the scenes with Holderman, um, just a lot of things that Coach Collin didn't agree with. He actually approached Coach Collin about borrowing money from the athletic department and Coach Carlin said, sure, but we're going to go to the press with this. And, and you know, if you're going to do that, there are certain guidelines you're going to follow. You're going to do this my way. And uh, they just butted heads and had for several years. And um, so uh, Holderman informed him that he had been fired via telephone. He, I don't even think he had the courage to do it to his face. And uh, so once Coach Carlin was fired, that same staff was kept. The only person that lost their job was Coach Carlin. Everybody else kept their job, and our defensive coordinator, Richard Bell, the guy that recruited me, was now the head coach. And uh, it just didn't seem right to me. It just didn't seem right to me. There was something about that that greatly bothered me. And it really just soured me on football, and it soured me on the whole process, and I wanted no part of it. So I went through spring ball um, the spring before the 82 season, and uh, but once spring was over with and we came home for the summer, I knew I wasn't going back, and I wasn't going to be a part of that 82 team. I wanted nothing to do with it. Football had just lost its luster and lost its fun and the passion that I had for it. And uh, and nothing against Coach Bell. I like Coach Bell. He's a fine man. But uh, I uh, So I set out the 82 season, and uh, it didn't work very well for Coach Bell. I think he, they won four games that year, maybe went four and seven. And uh, he lost his job after one season. And um, then Joe Morrison was hired. And um, I got a call one day from a guy named John Moore, who was one of the associate athletic directors uh, at the university. I'd gone to high school with his son, Bruce, and and knew Bruce pretty well. And and, uh, Dr. Moore called me up one day, and he said, look, Dale, he said, I know you've heard that we've hired Joe Morrison as our football coach. And he said, I think that you would really like him. And he said, "Uh, would you be interested in sitting down with Joe and talking to Joe? Uh, if I can arrange it about possibly coming back. And I said, sure, Dr. Moore, set it up. Let me know where I need to be, what time I need to be there. And uh, I'll gladly go talk with Coach Morrison. So he set up a meeting, and and, and I met with Coach Morrison, and I left there that day knowing that I had given him my word that I I wanted to be a part of that football team. He welcomed me back. He He never even brought up the subject of why I left. I went to tell him why I left. He said, hey, he said, I I don't need to know. He said, I could care less why you didn't play last year, why you left the team. He said, the only thing that concerns me, do you want to be a part of this 1983 football team? And I said, absolutely. He said, welcome back. And uh, the rest is history. Now, I know we want to talk to Dell Wilkes and get to know Dell Wilkes, but uh, this is, I, I personally, and I know I've had some friends who I've, I've talked to as well, we've always been intrigued by Morrison himself, just his persona, the fact that, you know, he's just, he almost had kind of a Johnny Cash essence about him. Um, 
you know, of course, I guess some of that could be attributed to the fact that he was uh, fond of wearing the color black. But, uh, I mean, you know, the smoke and the cigarettes on the sideline, which, of course, is a, a sign of the times because, um, you know, if, if you were not a – if you didn't have the opportunity to, to watch sports during the 80s, which I'm thankful that I did because things were just different. Um, they were just different, and especially – you mentioned going back on YouTube and watching uh, some George Rogers highlights. I think even though George probably wouldn't want you watching the replays of the South Carolina Georgia game where it was he and Herschel Walker, that was probably one of the best games I've ever seen where the two running backs just constantly were one up in each other. Um, but I don't want to go back. Um, speaking of just Joe Morrison, can you just talk about him as a person for someone who probably just knows just – the name and just kind of give a little bit more personality behind the man himself. Absolutely. Um, I knew who Joe Morrison was. Um, I was a, a sports fanatic. Uh, I mean, from the age of nine or 10, I was collecting football cards and I bought every streets and Smith magazine that came out prior to the start of the season. I, I mean, whether it was football, baseball, basketball, I just devoured it and, and I bought every publication I could get my hands on. So I knew who Joe Morrison was. I knew he was a giant great, one of the great football players in the history of the New York Giants. So um, I uh, I was excited about the opportunity to meet Joe and play for Joe. And there was you're exactly right. There was a mystique about Joe, and I think it's that way with with people that that are somewhat quiet. There's a presence about them. There's this you know this figure that you see that guy in all black standing on the sidelines, and he's got a Marlboro cup in his hand. And he's got the black windbreaker on with the collar flipped up and those black fighter pilot shades and the black ball cap and the black slacks. And, and there's just a mystique there. And he was a quiet guy. He didn't say a lot. Uh, he, he wasn't that forceful personality like Coach Carlin was. But yet when Joe spoke, you listened because Joe didn't say a lot. So you felt like when Joe had something to say, I better open up my ears and listen. But he was a guy that was easy to get to know. He was a player's coach. He um, he said, said very little, but what he said he meant. He didn't have many rules, but the ones he had, you better follow them. And when you walk into a locker room and you've got 18, 19, 20-year-old guys sitting around in the locker room and you can walk in with 14 years of NFL experience under your belt, you're instantly credible. That is instant credibility. And he had that. And he had been successful at New Mexico State. He'd been successful at UTC, uh, University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. So when he walked into a room, there was credibility galore, and you listened. And he surrounded himself with a good staff, and he let his staff do their job. But uh, he was a player's coach. Coach Carlin wasn't quite as approachable. There was always that, that, that personality of Coach Carlin that at times as a player, it would make you apprehensive to go approach Coach Carlin. But Joe, it was the exact opposite. He was easy to approach. He was easy to go sit down in his office and just prop your feet up. And just talk life, just talk football, or sit in the hall outside his office and just talk life and talk football. So he was a guy that um, we responded to very well when he got here in 83. And we did some good things in 83. But you could see that after the 83 season and some of the things that we did, and then spring ball and camp going into the 84 season, you could just see this thing starting to develop, to develop into what would be a very special year. And it all started in that 83 season and then, you know, was completed during that 84 season. And you did a nice little segue for me. I didn't even have to do it uh, because, you know, we definitely want to speak of the the so-called black magic season, which once again is just kind of one of those uh, kind of game caught lore stories. Um, I guess since we're already there, can just, you know, just go ahead and uh, dive into this 1984 season, which of course was your uh, consensus All-American season as well. Well, like I said, we um, we had a good uh, – I don't, I don't want to say good, but we did some things in 83 that you could see, man, if this group can stay together, if we can stay healthy, we could possibly do something special in 84. Now, let me take you back just a little bit. That group that he, in, that he inherited in 83, uh, that team, we were all recruited by Jim Collin for the most part. Uh, all of us were. So I talked about how well Coach Collin could recruit. Well, that 84 season's a reflection of that. There were 25 seniors on that 84 team, every one of them recruited by Jim Carlin and his staff. Uh, but we, we, we beat Southern Cal in Columbia in 83. 
Uh, we went to Tallahassee and played Florida State a good game, but lost. Played Clemson a very relatively good game, but lost. So you could see things starting to develop. And when we were going into the summer of 84, leading up into the 84 season, everybody stayed in town. All the guys went to summer school. That wasn't a sacrifice for me. I'm from Columbia. I live here. So it's an easy thing for me. But all those guys passed up on going home so we could all be in summer school together and all work out together and run together and train together. And that carried over into camp. And then, of course, we thought we could have a good year. We didn't know what that meant, what a good year meant, if that went in seven or eight ball games. We had no clue, but we felt like we could do something special. And as the season started and as it progressed and that thing started snowballing, it turned into a historical year. We were the first team ever in school history to win 10 games, still to this day the highest-ranked team in school history. We, At one point in the season, we were 9-0. and We were ranked second in the nation. Had a chance to play for a national championship had it not been for a bad day at Annapolis, Maryland. So, And then a lot of great things happened for me, obviously, being captain of that team, most valuable offensive player on that team, and the consensus All-American. But uh, that team just gelled. It had wonderful chemistry. It came together very well. We had a special coaching staff, a special head coach, and it just all clicked. It all came together. It was just a perfect storm of a lot of great things that happened and allowed us to have a magical, magical year. And I know you referenced, of course, the, uh, the, the Navy game, as everybody calls it, uh, which, I mean, that's exactly what it was. But um, just talk about that day. Was there just a sense when that day kind of kicked off, when you got out of bed, was there ever anything that kind of gave you the idea that, hmm, today something's just not right, something's different today? Did you feel any of that, or did it just kind of unwind and then unwind the way that you didn't want to? How did that day specifically go? It, it, it did not, no. We, we had a good week of practice uh, as well as I can remember. There was nothing happened that day when I woke up and I felt this, you know, uneasy feeling. None of that happened. Uh, we had prepared like we had always done. And uh, we got up there and it was just a, man, I'll never forget it. It was a clear day, but boy, it was cold. It was a cold, windy day, really clear. And uh, we just did not, we let a very average or below average team hang in there. We had opportunities the first few times we had the ball. We moved the ball down the field. We got it into the red zone. We had opportunities to score. But turnovers and I think a missed field goal, and, and, and there were just some things that we did that kept us from scoring. Or is if we would have taken care of business like we normally do on Saturdays, we could have gotten out to an early lead, and that probably never would have ever happened. But we kept making mistakes, and we kept giving them an opportunity to stay in the game, and they took advantage of that. And the next thing you know, it's 31-7, to 7, I think, and they're just beating, I mean, just beating our brains out. And um, all our hopes and dreams came, tra- uh, you know, crashing down that day. It had been a wonderful year. It had been just a, it'd been a dream of a year. And uh, we realized where you're at. You know that you're the second-ranked team in the nation, and we know that if you go out and win – you got a possibility of, of, you know, being the number one team in the nation, and therein lies maybe an opportunity to play for a national championship. We were fully aware of all that. And I don't think any of that had anything to do with what happened that day, just other than the fact that we just went out and made mistakes and some critical mistakes and allowed this team to get on a, a bit of a run, and they did, and we just never could catch up. Man. And it's, I, I think, to this day, in my opinion, still probably the most – that loss probably cost us more than any loss in the history of Gamecock football, in my opinion. It was it was a devastating loss for what could have been and the possibilities we could have had to be the number one team in the nation because the team that was number one was Nebraska. They got beat that day. So absolutely, had you had we gone the Navy and won, we're the one ranked team in the country. We've got an inside shot to go to the Orange Bowl and play for a national championship. And that was all just washed away that afternoon in Annapolis, Maryland. And in addition to that, just reflecting on that 1984 season, this was the team that uh, went to Notre Dame and won 36-32. Uh, went, uh, didn't go to Florida State. I'm sorry, Florida State played in Columbia that day. Won that game uh, 38-26. Then, of course, the week after the Navy game, um, you um, go to Clemson, uh, win a tight one there, 22-21. to And then, of course, the Gator Bowl versus Oklahoma State, which was uh, – 
a low scoring affair that unfortunately um, South Carolina came out on the losing end of. Um, but still, nonetheless, a historic season considering, you know, the, the, the history of South Carolina uh, as far as just like you mentioned, uh, the first 10 win season. Um, just, uh, you know, just a quick question about, you know, how does a coach like uh, Joe Morrison, how does he um, respond after a game like the Navy game? What, what, what was his personality like at the end of that game? Well, it, it's um, it's a story that's been repeated many times, and, and I think one that a lot of people are aware of. Every Sunday, um, we would meet. Yeah, it, I forget the terminology we use for it, but we had a room up in the stadium, almost like a theater room, and uh, that would be where every Sunday afternoon we would meet uh, to just recap the game the day before. And just to get a few pointers about the upcoming game and what to expect this week in practice as we prepare for our next opponent. And for nine Sundays, we had we were nine and zero. Uh, boy, that was a, a rowdy room. Every Sunday when we were together, man, we were celebrating the win the day before. We we're laughing and high fiving and cutting up. And when Joe would walk in, you know, the assistant coaches would have to shh everybody and tell us to be quiet. And you know, Joe's going to address the room. But that Sunday. None of that happened. It was funeral home dead, brother. I mean, nobody was talking. Nobody was making noise. Nobody was laughing. Nobody was cutting up. It was dead silence. And Joe walked in, and there was a big blackboard on the wall, and he grabbed a piece of chalk, and he wrote one, two, three, four, the numbers, one, two, three, four. And beside number one, he wrote national championship. Beside number two, he wrote number one team in the nation. Beside number three, he wrote Orange Bowl. And beside number four, he wrote down what the potential payoff was for the Orange Bowl. I forget what it was at that time. And when he wrote them down, he set that piece of chalk down, and he turned around, and he said, look at that, guys. He said, that's what you cost yourself yesterday. Hope you can live with it. And he walked out. And he didn't even say anything. He didn't even say anything else. That said it all. It was there. On a big old chalkboard, it was there for all of us, just plain to see what we had lost just 24 hours earlier. And uh, it was devastating, man. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't think we were going to snap out of it. I didn't think we were going to kick out. Um, practice that week, it was just like there was just this low-hanging cloud over the team. It was just uh, a week that really lacked enthusiasm, especially leading up to the Clemson game, like you would normally have. Um I think we were all trying to process and deal with what we had just done. And we had we had cost ourselves all those things that Joe had written on the chalkboard. We did it. It was our fault. And you've got to deal with that and process that and put that behind you and then play your biggest game of the year, your, your in-state rival, your, you know, a heated rivalry game. And uh, even into the first half of the game, we carried that hangover with us. We didn't play very well. But right before halftime, things started changing up at Clemson that day, and some good things started happening. And then it carried over into the third and fourth quarter. And with about 54 seconds left to go, uh, we scored a touchdown after driving 86 yards in a little over three minutes. And uh, Mike Holt scored, and then Scott Hagler kicked the extra point, and we won 22-21. to 21. But, buddy, it took us a while to kick out, and I'm talking about literally – late into the second quarter of that Clemson game before we started to come alive a little bit and realize, man, we can – they got up on 21-3. to three. They were up 21-3 to three at the drop of a hat. And I'm sure most Gamecock fans, Gamecock fans were thinking, wow, you know, so much of this special season. But we were able to recover. It was a good halftime. And uh, I remember it was hot that day. And Coach Morrison was going around encouraging everybody at halftime. And he just felt that – we're right where we need to be, and we've got this thing under control, and we went out in the second half, and they never crossed the 50-yard line in the second half. Our defense played just swarming football, that fire ant defense, and we were able to put together a couple of sustained drives, especially that last drive where we went 84 yards in a little over three minutes and scored the winning touchdown, and uh, it turned into a wonderful day. It was the, uh, the only time that I was part of a victory against Clemson, and we beat them in all orange. I think at that point they had never lost in those all orange outfits. So what started off as a bad day turned into a glorious day. 
And just, um, I'm going to come back because obviously I want to talk to you some uh, about some other things, but I just want to fast forward a little bit, just uh, something, a question that I have. Um, you know, fast forward approximately this time last year. Um, I know since Muschamp has taken over the program, I know Ryan Brewer has uh, really put together like an alumni group. You guys came out, play a little bit before the game starts, kind of get a chance to go back and, and see folks maybe you haven't seen for a while. And I was able to uh, find you on the field and just kind of run over and shake your hand. And I, the thing that stuck out to me was, as you said, that this is my first time here in a long time. For a former South Carolina athlete like yourself, I mean, we're talking from 1984 to 2019. and that time span, what, what has your kind of involvement with the University of South Carolina been and, and your experiences with the coaching staffs and things like that? How has that been for you? Pretty much non-existent. Uh, this isn't an athletic department that's known for reaching out and embracing former athletes and football players. Uh, I think that's changed over the course of the last few years. I think Coach Muschamp and, and Ray Tanner, uh, I think you've done a better job of that. But uh, previous administrations, uh, not so well. And uh, so I've watched from afar. Uh, I think I was part of the Letter Letterman's Association 20 years ago for a year or two, uh, maybe even longer than that. But it's not been a very embracing athletic department when it comes to those things. Um, and uh, matter of fact, I know this was a different group of people and a, and a different staff and a different athletic director. But in 1994, uh, as we were getting ready for the 10-year anniversary of that 84 season, and in 94 – Keep in mind, we were still the only team in school history at that point that had won 10 games. Um, you know, Spurrier had that three-year run there of 11 wins. But this was 94, so I reached out to the athletic department, and I was going to try to put something together uh, to get as many guys in town uh, where we could get together and just, you know, sort of celebrate what we did 10 years ago. And through the Letterman's Association and through the athletic department, I reached out to them to see if I could maybe get a list of Names, addresses, phone numbers of guys that maybe were in the Letterman's Association uh, that maybe donated to the Gamecock Club that were on that 84 team. Keep in mind, this was before cell phones and social media, so it was a little more tough to reach out to people back then. We didn't have Facebook and Twitter. And they just flat out told me, thanks, but no thanks. We have no interest in doing that. We have no interest in assisting you in doing that. We have no interest in that whatsoever. Good luck. Um, you know, move on. So, um, like I said, they've not been a very embracing uh, athletic department when it comes to that. And I'm not talking about you got to reach out and kiss our butt and make us feel special. I realize that's a long time ago, man. A lot of people nowadays that are alive and buy season tickets that weren't even alive then, that could care less what happened then. But um, I'm glad that they've done a better job of that. And with this flag football game before the spring game, the day of the spring game, and the day before, you get to have uh, uh, a meal with Muschamp and ask him whatever questions you have on your mind about the condition of the athletic pro or the football program and where this football program's headed. And uh, I appreciate that, but for a long time, that wasn't there. And, you know, I think Clemson has always done a fabulous job of that, uh, a wonderful job of reaching out to former football players and having them come back to games and seeing them on the sidelines and, and, and making them a part of what they're doing. But, uh, I'm glad the university uh, is doing a better job of that. It's interesting to hear that sentiment, but I definitely have heard the same sentiments um, from other players. I think Ryan Brewer pretty much steamheaded that movement, and I think from what I was told is that Muschamp has been very supportive of that movement. Um, I know he's proud that uh, that he sees the group of folks that have come uh, been able to come back because um, in a couple of years that they've done that, I've noticed that the enrollment has significantly increased. So. Um, hopefully that is something that we'll see more and more of because it is it's very very nice to see like you said just more involvement from the uh, from the alumni especially folks like yourself who were on that 10 win team and just uh, kind of moving forward it'd be interesting to see what uh, continues to happen there and just uh, getting a little more personal and um, if anybody has not listened to any Del Wilkes interviews you can find plenty of them on YouTube and Del Wilkes is a very honest person. That's the one thing that I've noticed. He's a very honest person. Um, he's not a guy who's going to pretend like he's a perfect person. To, I appreciate myself personally because I can definitely see how he's used this to create some good. 
Um, there's a story back, and I want to say it was your junior year at Carolina, maybe 1983, if I'm incorrect, please definitely correct me on that. But uh, there's a story that I've heard that um, there was a game that when you, I guess, had your players and coaches meeting, it was said that Del Wilkes is the reason that we lost that game. Can you talk about that story? Yeah, okay, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, actually, that was after my uh, my sophomore year. Sophomore year, okay. Um, yeah, after my sophomore year. And uh, I uh, – guys are a lot bigger today. Just through nutrition and through science and technology and weightlifting and improvements in weightlifting, improvements in nutrition. Uh, when kids hit college today, they're bigger, they're stronger, they're faster uh, than they ever have been before. Um, and I, we thought we were ahead of the game in 1981. We thought we were working with the best technology and, you know, we, we were just way ahead with our weight room and our facilities. But when you fast forward to 2020 and you see what we have access to now, not so much, but we went to Athens and, um, I was a skinny 240 pound, uh, sophomore offensive guard. And I'm playing against a guy that was a two-time All-SEC, I mean, two-time, yeah, All-SEC, uh, two-time first-team All-American and uh, defensive lineman. I think his name was Eddie Weaver. I'm not sure about that. But this cat was jacked. I mean, brother, he was a man. And I'm talking about physically he was a man. And he was fast. He was explosive. And I'm a 240-pound sophomore that is just getting my butt kicked. I mean, every way you can imagine. I'm hesitant to come off the ball because I feel like if I fire off the ball, he's going to sidestep me and give me that old uh, bullfighter Ole deal. And then if I'm passive, he's going to run over me. So I didn't know what to do. I'd had no clue. I was just overmatched. He was so much more physically ahead of me that it was just crazy. He just dogged me that day and embarrassed me. And the bad thing about that is there's always film. There's always film that your coaches are going to go watch, and then you get to watch it with your coaches in front of your teammates, and you get to get humiliated again and embarrassed again about that. And I played so bad and got abused so bad that day that Coach Carlin stood me up in front of the team. Same guy that would later become like a father figure to me. That day I wanted to kill him. But he stood me up in front of the team after practice, Monday afternoon after the Georgia game, and just... I mean, brow beat me. It was unbelievable. I mean, you were horrible. You were, I mean, are you sure you're even built to play this game? It was embarrassing. Your, the way you played your performance, son, you got your butt kicked. He just typically dominated you. We got to have better than that. I thought you were better than that. Maybe I made a mistake in recruiting you. Everything you could imagine, he hit me upside the head with it. And I determined that day, now whether or not I was the reason we lost that game, I don't think they were a much better team than we were at that point. But that did light a fire under me. And I promised myself that I would do whatever I had to do, whatever. As long as it was legal and lawful, I would do whatever I needed to do to make sure that no man ever physically dominated me like that again. And I did. And, um, it was not against NCAA rules. There was no rules against it. There was no drug testing back then. I actually called a team doctor, Dr. Emmett Lunsford, who was now dead, and uh, died in a plane crash. And I called Dr. Lunsford, and I said, Dr. Lunsford, I said, I'm doing everything I possibly can to get big. I'm eating. I'm just packing the food in. I'm going to the weight room, and I just don't seem to get bigger or stronger. I have hit the wall. And I said, I've heard a lot of people talk about testosterone, dianabol, anabolic steroid. And uh, he said, what's your pharmacy's phone number? And I gave it to him, and he called me in. A prescription, I think it was maybe injectable testosterone or either dianabol, but, but one of those. And again, this was in 1981. There was no drug testing. There was no rules, nothing. I didn't break any rules. It was prescribed to me by a doctor, a team doctor. And... Uh, so I, uh, I used what was prescribed to me, and uh, I got bigger, I got faster, and I got stronger. I, I liken this to a story. My mom is a little small, teeny tiny, little four foot eleven British lady um, who came over in the '60s. I say I kid her and tell her she came over as part of the you know the British invasion. 
But you know, I, I she really, really opened my eyes to a lot of music. She is a very, very knowledgeable music person, says great taste in music, and of course, um, I remember one day making a reference to this being like drug-induced music, and she said, well, you know, that may be true, but at the time, you have to know what it was like at that time. That wasn't something that people were aware of. They didn't realize the ramifications. They didn't realize what bad things could happen because this was something new. This was something that people were doing. They thought it was harmless, so it wasn't the same mindset that we had at you know today in reference to these mind-altering drugs, you know, then it was just something like, like you're saying that was pretty readily available. So, you know, I guess my take on that is I definitely see where you're coming because I definitely have uh, that exposure. But for folks who weren't around at that time, and it, it's, this isn't just a Dell Wilkes thing. Um, this is a thing that was prevalent in pro sports as well. One of my favorite players from that time period was Lyle Alzado, who, of course, became, uh, I don't, I don't want to say a big movie star, but he had several uh, several roles as well. But, um, of course, that's what ended up um, taking his life. But, you know, it was a situation to where with when you have doctors writing prescriptions, there's a trust there that you think, okay, this is coming from a doctor. I can trust them. They, they, are, they know what they're doing. So it's not like today where you would have to find somebody who can get it for you who's not a doctor but maybe has a connection, something like that. Back then, it was just a matter of uh, getting a prescription, and that pretty much yeah. just seems like it wasn't that difficult to get. Well, I'll tell anybody, and, and, and I agree with what you said about the music and you know the conversation with your mom. Back then, in the 80s, um, anabolic steroids were, much, which were as much a part of football as a helmet, a chin strap, and shoulder pads were. And uh, there was no testing for it. And again, I, I did it illegal. I didn't buy it off, you know, at the back of a gym out of some guy's truck, you know, by the light of the moon. Uh, I talked to a team doctor who prescribed it to me. And uh, and it was very prevalent back then. And um, it was it was done. And, and guys, you, you could just, you could see the look. And I got my brains beat in that day. And uh, now I never drug tested this cat after the game. I don't know if he was on anything, if he was clean. But I just knew that in order for me to be competitive at that point in time, when I was playing college football, that was something I needed to do. And it wasn't Dr. Lunsford's fault. Um, I don't blame him or anybody else. But times have changed. And, and we've obviously, obviously, we've changed with it. And we don't do things like that today. And I certainly would not advise anyone to do that. But at that particular point in time in my career, it was what I felt like was what I needed to do to be competitive. Now, you call me whatever you want to, and I'll live with that. I mean, it's uh, it's been something that um, – uh, and I could care less about things like this, but a few years ago um, there was someone that brought my name up uh, for the University of South Carolina Athletic Hall of Fame. And uh, I was unanimously – selected to be inducted into the university's Hall of Fame. Uh, but it was it's made uh, by Ray Tanner because of my admission of what I did back then. And uh, it was just felt like that it wouldn't be a good look. Uh, I don't even know if this Hall of Fame even exists. I think it's a Hall of Fame in name only. But, um, and again, uh, the people that were on this committee that, that voted to put me into the University of South Carolina, Hall of, South Carolina Hall of Fame were very well aware of what I did and why I did it and why I used steroids at that particular time. And they still felt like that even so, uh, this guy should still be in the University's Hall of Fame, but I uh, kind of wouldn't have anything, you know, wouldn't let it happen. And I could care less. Who cares about stuff like that? I don't need that to, you know, to, um, make me feel good about my career at South Carolina. I know what I did and what I contributed. And I understand why I did that. I'm perfectly fine with it. That's perfectly fine. But, you know, those things, it's a different time today. And certainly we would certainly tell anyone not to do that and and uh, vehemently argue against that. But at that particular time, it was just part of it. It was part of the athletic uh, experience for a lot of football players across America, be it college or NFL. And I think, too, uh, just a point of mentioning, and I'm going to kind of give away my, my other hat, so to speak, because I was a, a school teacher for a while, 
and uh, some of the things that I've discussed with athletes before. A lot of times, I, 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 in my opinion and in my experience, a lot of times athletes, by someone who's just on the outside looking in, are just expected to be grown men. But we're still dealing with, in some cases, guys are coming in as young as 17 now. Um, yep. You know, 17, 18, 19, very impressionable. You know, somebody like a team doctor who's older, a trustworthy figure, um, somebody who would you, you, you would assume... And once again, this is a different time, so you wouldn't necessarily say that he should known better. But you know, for a, for a 17, 18 year old guy just to go to a uh, you know to a team doctor, and the team doctor says, "Oh yeah, this is," and then there you go. I mean, that's that particular situation, that particular scenario, definitely says a lot about what was going on at that time. And once again, I think the point that's very important there is just that, as you stated, and as of uh, as I've read and heard in many other places too. Once again, there was no rule against it, couldn't get tested, and then lose uh, lose the rest of your career, lose the rest of a season, something like that. So uh, I think it's an interesting perspective, especially for somebody like yourself who was there. And just moving forward, I know you had an opportunity to play in the NFL. That didn't necessarily work out probably the way that you wanted to. We won't get too deep into your pro, um, pro wrestling career because I, I feel like that would be a different podcast for a different day. Um, I did just want to touch on a couple of little areas there just for our folks who are wrestling fans because um, you're out of football now. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you trained uh, locally when you decided to be uh, to, to make the move into wrestling. Um, can you just talk about kind of your transition going from being a college football player into being a professional wrestler? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my NFL career was very short. I signed with the uh, – Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 85 as a free agent, and then I was in camp with the Falcons in 86, and they released me prior to the start of the 86 season, and I had always been a huge wrestling fan. Uh, I was as much of a wrestling fan as I was a Gamecock fan when I was a kid. Those guys were larger than life to me, and every Saturday they came on my TV, and I watched them, and I idolized those guys, and I went to my first match at the Township Auditorium in 1971. A family friend took me. And I saw Jack and Jerry Briscoe, man, and those guys were, wow, they were larger than life to me. And I had all the wrestling magazines. And so I had decided in college that whenever football ended for me, if it was after college or if I had an opportunity to have an NFL career, whenever it ended, I was curious about this pro wrestling world. And um, I decided that that's going to be the next thing I'm going to do. So after the Falcons released me, I came back to Columbia in 86 and uh, in 87, uh, the only wrestling school that I was aware of was here in Columbia, and it was owned and operated by the fabulous Moolah, probably the most famous lady wrestler ever, uh, and really uh, one of the big names in, in professional wrestling, male or female, was the fabulous Moolah, and she was born and raised in Columbia, and uh, she was the ladies' WWF champ for 28 consecutive years, so she was a big deal. And, uh, and also, too, it was close and it was affordable. I had checked in some other wrestling schools that were a little further away, and they were thousands of dollars, but Moolah's was 1500 bucks, and we'll train you to be a professional wrestler. And uh, so I paid my 1500 bucks and set off on my wrestling career. And uh, it started in a little shed uh, with a ring in it in Moolah's backyard over on Moolah Drive. And um, she had some guys here that worked for her, uh, on the little show, she would run around South Carolina, and uh, they had day jobs. They they were plumbers. They were electricians. One of them was a cop. But on weekends, she would run little shows around the state, and uh, they were wrestlers on weekends. And they probably didn't know a whole lot more than I did. But uh, what little bit they knew, they passed on to me and uh, tried to teach me. And then on one of her shows, um, she brought in a big name, a guy named Wahoo McDaniel. And... Uh, I was very well aware who Wahoo was. Uh, Wahoo was another one of those guys that was an iconic name to me when I was a kid. He played in the NFL, played at Oklahoma, played in the NFL nine or ten years, and was a world, I mean, world famous professional wrestler. So that night that Wahoo worked her show, uh, I got to know him, and uh, he sort of took me under his wing and, and uh, mentored me for the next few years and helped advance my career. And um, so it was uh, Wahoo was someone that played a big, big role in my wrestling career and had a huge impact on me. Uh, but, yeah, it all started on Moolah Drive. 
and it's fun to talk and just hear the stories because of um, you know that that's the same time of course that I was coming up watching wrestling. Um, I will admittedly say that I was never well at the time it was WWF, but of course you know now it's WWE. But uh, I was never a big WWF fan. That was to me was a little more gimmicky than I liked. And uh, I was the guy that was parked on the floor in front of the big wooden TV console TV sitting on the floor. Tuning in to WCW, you know, watching the NWA wrestling, catching guys like the Ric Flairs, the, you know, the, the Rock and Roll Express, the, the Midnight Express, those guys. An interesting story from my perspective is, I actually have a couple of stories, not that I have a whole lot to talk about wrestling, definitely no, nowhere close to what you uh, have experienced. One of the things that, I, that I, I thought was neat as far as Del Wilkes, the Patriot, is uh, I was one of those guys who I'd get home and turn on global wrestling and a guy by the name of the Patriots who is, uh, I would venture to say, and you can definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but probably the top baby face on that production. Um, yep. Always main events came in. At, it had to be during the Gulf War because of the, uh, the finisher, the Patriot missile, those sorts of things. So I was a huge Patriot fan and not the Tom Brady Patriots, the, the Patriot, <laughs> <laughs> not the Patriots, but the That's Patriot. Right. The- the important Patriot. Right, exactly. Um, so I was a huge Patriot fan at that time. I had learned, you know, okay, hey, this guy's name is Del Wilkes, but um, for whatever reason in my brain, I never put the two together. <laughs> so I remember my freshman year at University of South Carolina, 1994, I was at the Adams Bookstore, and they had packs of USC sports cards, and I was a huge sports card collector. So I said, hey, cool, I've never seen these before. So I just went ahead and opened up a pack, and what's the first card that pops up but Adele Wilkes? (laughs) And at that moment, I said, wait a minute. (laughs) Same guy. I said, and of course, as you alluded to earlier, there is no internet, there's no cell phones. I mean, it it was sparse, I'll say that. Um, So I have to go and find people that might know. So finally I find a guy from Orangeburg, South Carolina, who just, as you talk about a walking encyclopedia, and I walk in and I say, Huck, that was that's what we called him. He said, Huck, I said, Dill Wilkes, that's the Patriot, right? And he just gives me this look and he's like, and? <laughs> <laughs> so that was my realization. How it took me that long, I don't know. So, of course, from that point on, um, it, it's been a very, very neat thing for me to, you know, to be able to have like the South Carolina ties. And, um, and just for the folks listening, I have been meaning to speak with Dale Wilkes for, it feels like two years now, but it's just the timing never quite worked out. So maybe that's one of the good things about this whole quarantine. But uh, it was kind of sparked when I was walking out of the stadium one day after a game and I happened to look up on the wall where they have the, uh, I guess, the wall of captains, the hall of captains, mm-hmm. whatever they call it. And I just happened to walk by and see, oh, well, there's team captain Dale Wilkes. And I said, you know what? It would be cool to reach out to some of these guys and, you know, and here we are, um, I guess better late than never. But uh, just moving on, you know, nobody wants to hear me talk. They definitely want to hear from uh, Dale Wilkes himself. So I know the story, so I try not to inject too much. But um, originally you were the trooper, and I've always had a question about the trooper. When yep. you wrote your tickets, now for those who don't know, after you beat somebody, you would write them a ticket and just rip it out and throw it down on them. Did you actually write anything on the tickets? Was it just scribble? Was there any kind of funny scenarios that maybe you wrote on there? Can you just kind of walk us through how the Trooper gig developed um, and just, you know, just just kind of take us inside that particular character? Well, um, I didn't. I, I would just scribble on the, um, on the sheet of paper. I had a little spiral notebook, and the spiral was at the top. Instead of on the sides, you just flip it over like that. And... Um, it, uh, and that was my ticket book. It wasn't a very well put together gimmick. Uh, Vern Gagne, Greg Gagne, his son that were running the AWA at the time came up with the idea. And the idea came through one of those guys that I was talking about that trained me or helped train me at Moolah's. Uh, he was one of those guys that Moolah would use on those weekend shows back then on TV. They no longer do that, but there were guys they called job guys or enhancement guys, and they would go out and put the, the stars over in a minute or two. Uh, you were there, your sole purpose was just to make this particular superstar from the WWE, WWF, look good. And he beat you up in a minute, two or three minutes. And uh, so she would send those guys up to Vince to do TV every now and then as enhancement talent. But his job 
his nine to five job. And he was a deputy sheriff in Orangeburg County. And when he would work these shows for Moolah, he would incorporate his day job into his wrestling character. And he worked as the super enforcer. And, um, so when I get to the AWA in the late eighties and I'm working for Vern, this is in Minneapolis, Minnesota, that connection with Wahoo, Wahoo was working in the office for Vern and was still wrestling some for Vern in the AWA. That Wahoo connection led me to the AWA and they were on ESPN Monday through Friday from four to five o'clock, that same spot that global would eventually have. And, um, so I get to Minneapolis and I'm there a week or two and Alan, that's the guy's name, the deputy sheriff, Orangeburg County. He called me and he said, Hey man, he said, if I put together a highlight tape of some of my matches, he said, would you be okay if I mailed it to you and you passed it off to Vern and Wahoo and let them take a look at it? And I said, absolutely dude, you know, send it to me. So he sent me a tape and I got it a few weeks later and I took it to Wahoo and Vern one day and I thought no more of it. And a couple of weeks down the road, Vern called me and he said, I need you to come to the office. He said, there's something I want to talk to you about. So uh, I get over to the home offices of the AWA and I walk in and there's Wahoo, Greg and Vern sitting there. And uh, Vern says, you know that tape you gave me with that guy down in South Carolina that does that cop gimmick? I said, yeah. He said, we have no interest in him. He needs to remain a cop. Wrestling's not in his future, but we like the idea of a character like that. You've got that sort of square-jawed look about you, that southern accent. He said, now I'm seeing a trooper, a deputy sheriff, or a highway patrol-type character. And uh, he said, we think you're the guy that can do it and pull it off, and we'll make you this white meat baby face. And, you know, you fight for truth, justice in the American way. And I said, I'm in. Sign me up. And uh, so that really opened a door for me because while the AWA was literally – on life support at that time and basically a dying company that wouldn't stay open much longer. It exposed me to a nationwide audience by being on ESPN. And so when they went out of business, the, I mean, the um, GWF started up and um, they uh, approached me about going to Dallas. That's where they were going to have their home office and, and do all their TV tapings at the old sportatorium in Dallas, Texas. And, uh, so they said, that's me a ticket, and I'm flying out to Dallas for the first ever global TV taping. And uh, I've got my trooper gear with me because nobody's told me anything different. I figured I'm going up and I'm working as the trooper. And um, I get to the hotel, I check in, and a few hours later, the guys that were running the company, Bill Eady, who uh, wrestled as uh, one half of demolition in the WWF, and a guy named Joe Petticino, uh called me and um uh, so look, we want to come talk to you. We've got an idea. And uh, they came to my room, or actually I went to Joe's room. And uh, Joe's wife had this, um, in just a rolled up brown paper bag, grocery bag. She pulled out this red, white, and blue mask, red, white, and blue tights, and red, white, and blue trunks. And you're exactly right as to the relationship of the Gulf War. Uh, we were involved in that. The patriotism was really at a fever pitch. And they said, we're thinking that wrestling could use a very patriotic character right now as we're battling Saddam Hussein and that evil Iranian empire. And it blew up. It was, uh, it, that night when I walked through the curtain and went down the aisle to the sportatorium, that was the first time anybody had ever seen that character. And that place erupted. And, uh, so I was at the right place at the right time, man. And somebody else had the idea and I'm very thankful that they did. And I've been to some of those shows similar to what you're speaking of, which um, it's always interesting to hear about how a character is created because, uh, you know, some of them do tend to, to go over immediately. Some of them do take a time, uh, take a little bit of time before people kind of warm up to them. And then, of course, there's the, the gimmicks that just never seem to get off the ground, like the, let's say, the Shockmaster, which was probably one of the worst ever, if not the worst. <laughs> one of the things I've always thought was interesting, because I've been to WrestleMania. I went to WrestleMania a few years ago when it was in New Orleans. It's a, I mean, it's an amazing spectacle. It really, really is. But I'm always going to be a purist at heart. Probably my other somewhat funny claim to fame story, if you want to call it that. I've got a friend of mine who is, uh, he's had some opportunities with WWE, probably not as big as he would like, but... Um, he and I went down to a show in Walterboro, and this is not too terribly long ago. There's a lot of little small production still going on these days, of course. You know, the, the main emphasis 
is always going to be WWE with their ability to reach out and be on TV and, and whatnot. So we were at this small production in um, Walterboro, and we get there, and the guy comes out and says, hey, we, um, we may have to cut some of the matches tonight. There's only one ref, and we've got a, too big of a card for one ref to cover each and every match. And I'm just sitting there thinking, okay, we just drove to Walterboro for no reason. Nothing against Walterboro, but that's not somewhere I'd just choose to go for unless I have a specific reason. No to be reason. There. And uh, so my friend, who is the wrestler who trained um, with Susan Green, I'm not sure if you've had any interaction with, uh, with uh, I guess she calls herself Tex, who uh, she actually has a place out, I think out in Congaree, if I'm not mistaken. But um, right. he just says, don't worry, I, my friend right here, he's trained, he'll do, he'll do some matches. <laughs> so my gimmick, <laughs> believe it or not, is the barefoot ref, because when I went to watch this show, which was in the dead of summer, in Walterboro, so you can imagine what the, the weather and the atmosphere and everything was like. Uh, so all I have on is just a T-shirt, a pair of shorts, and I'm just wearing a pair of, uh, I guess people today call them slides, sandals, whatever. So they say, oh, well, you comfortable doing that? And, I mean, I was on the spot, had a very <laughs> limited time to response, and I said, oh, I, I guess I can't say no now, can I? But I had no <laughs> tennis shoes, wearing a pair of shorts. They throw a black and white at me. I put it on, and, and then I... I go out and I ref a couple of matches with uh, a pair of shorts on and no shoes. So that that is my gimmick <laughs> at this point, and it stuck with me. I've got the video. It's uh, it's it, and I mean it's fun for for people who are critical. You know, I I'm sensitive, I guess, to the critical nature because I grew up watching it. I enjoyed it. I've loved it. I've got friends who participate in it, and I mean guys like yourself who came up when you did. And this gets me back to my point. I'm bad about going off on tangents. This gets back to my points. When you went out to wrestle that night for the very first time as the Patriot, talk about that arena. Because arenas like that are not what folks know today. They're, it's not like going to the Colonial Knife Arena to watch a WWE show. Um, just what was that atmosphere like? What was, I mean, did, did they even have AC in those buildings? It did not. In, in the Sportatorium in Dallas, it, it's a very famous venue. Um, and this is this was in the early nineties, and and I think the Sportatorium was probably built in the forties, and um, it was a venue that Elvis Presley played when he was you know on his rise to fame, and it was a venue that that, that basically was used for country music and, and wrestling, and it was a smaller venue, and, and and the people were right on top of it, it maybe would see two thousand people, maybe something like that, maybe a little bit more. But there's no air conditioning, and it's just an old wooden building. And this was in uh, that very first night when I went down the aisle there at the Sportatorium. This is in the middle of June. And, um, I mean, it's hotter than blue blazes. There, there's no air circulation. There's no air conditioner. Uh, the, the, the dressing rooms are back in the bowels of this old building, and it's stink, and it's damp, and it's dark back there. And, and you can just tell that there's been no airflow back here. It's just a musty smell. So, no, it's not a glamorous, well-lit building with 15,000 people sitting around. It was a small arena. Uh, there were a lot of people there that night, but it was just boiling hot, sick air. And I'm wearing this mask, and it is just, I mean, it's like an inferno. And especially, too, at TV, they've got those lights on anyway. And uh, the lights at the sportatorium were literally, that ring light right over the ring was literally right on top of you. So that's even more heat. And, uh, but no, it's not glamorous in, in no way, shape, or form. As a matter of fact, most of those shows that I worked for Moola when I was coming up, I've worked in bars. I've worked in VFWs. I've worked county fairs. You were talking about having to be called into action with uh, shorts and a T-shirt and flip-flops. We went to work a county fair one night somewhere in North Carolina. And this is in the beginning of my career when you're working venues and events like this. And the guy that was supposed to show up with the ring, the promoter had paid him so much money to rent his ring that night. Well, another local rival promoter paid him more money not to show up with the ring and to ruin this guy's show. So we're at a little county fair. So what do we do? We The promoter goes over and gets some hay, uh, bales of hay from the animal. Uh, where they've got the animals on display, and he just puts out a bunch of hay. Somebody has a, a roll of um, uh, poly, and we roll over it. We roll it over that, make a little tart light, 
take some basically tomato steaks and drive them down into four corners and take baling twine and make that our ring and our ropes and uh, and work in the middle of that. Now, you couldn't hit the ropes. You couldn't lean up against them. But at least we had an area there that we could consider a ring. And we got in and one only performed for the people. So, no, it's working small venues like that. It's working clubs and, and what we used to refer to as honky tonks and little bars and things like that. Now, eventually, you do get to those Madison Square Garden venues and, you know, Caesars Palace and Budokan and Tokyo, Japan. But, boy, in the beginning, it's nothing like that. It's rental cars and uh, sleeping in your car uh, on the side of the road or sleeping in a Walmart parking lot in your car. It's a lot of that that goes on. And I can definitely, um, I, I, I won't say I understand because I definitely haven't been down the path that you guys have endured, but I can definitely appreciate it i've had an opportunity to speak to several folks i've been very blessed being a big wrestling fan of course I've, I've i have other things that i do photography as well which has really opened up some opportunities i've had a chance to speak with ron simmons one-on-one -on -one, sat down with him for probably probably 30 45 minutes which he's a great great guy to talk to and i spoke yeah. to him about you and he was just absolutely glowed talking about dell um, and then of course I talked with, uh, Jim Duggan. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you hear folks talk about how miserable some of these former wrestlers are from that time period and Hacksaw is not that guy. Hacksaw will tell you that life has nope. given him or wrestling has given him a great life. And so he has nothing negative to say about it. He's very, um, very complimentary of it. But the one thing I did want to kind of mention myself was just, um, just having watched my friend train and this was with susan green who is very old school um she was uh, if i'm not mistaken i think she was wrestling with the rock's dad so she was she was wrestling you know back in those days so she still trains very similar to those ways and i know when my friend was learning to take bumps over the ropes and stuff landing on her ring there is no give um right. and it, it was just over 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 constantly to the point to where he just he couldn't even walk anymore and I know you can appreciate that because that's, that's from what I was told and what I've been educated on from speaking with some of these older folks. I mean, that was normal for you guys. And like you just mentioned, and there were cases where you didn't have the option of even taking bumps and rings because maybe a ring wasn't available. So, you know, I, I, I guess from a personal standpoint where I get a little sensitive is uh, when folks make reference to, well, you know, wrestling's fake anyway. Well, it's like, well, when you have a shallow perspective and that's really all you can say, then, you know, it, it's not even worth the breath. When, it, when I was able to see what you guys endure behind the scenes from a training perspective, just what all goes into it and nothing is guaranteed um, from, and that was the biggest thing that stuck out to me was, is you put in all this time and energy and effort and it might just come down to a situation where somebody just looks at you and says, no, I don't like you. I don't like your personality. Yep. You can't talk on a mic. So, I don't want to talk too much on myself once again, because like I said, I'm great on going off on tangents. But one of the things that does kind of start with me growing up, of course, like I said, I did watch a lot of WCW. One of the one of the folks that I absolutely despised back then, but I have learned to really greatly appreciate just how good and knowledgeable he is, is Jim Cornette. And I'm pretty sure, and once again, this is one of those scenarios where if I'm inaccurate, please correct me. When you were when you had your opportunity with WWE, Jim Cornette seemed like he was one of your biggest supporters. I think uh, Jim Cornette, Bruce Prichard, uh, Jim Ross, I think those guys were really, really behind you as far as really pushing your character. Because if I'm, I think they brought you in from Japan, this is when you had your opportunity to kind of do the America versus Canada angle where you actually were able to go against, uh, I think, Owen Hart. And you were teaming up some with Shawn Michaels as well. Um, what was it like being around those guys, just knowing that behind the scenes they're trying to push you and maybe Vince was the guy who maybe wasn't sold on you? Well, I had I had a chance to go to work for Vince in the early 90s. And um, I, I went up and met with Vince and actually went out on the road and worked some shows. But at that particular time, I, I just was not going to give up the deal I had in Japan. Um I had a great deal in Japan, and, and, and I guess I can understand people feeling this way, but I had a tremendous career before I got to the WWF, and I guess people look at the WWF as sort of, or now the WWE, it was the WWF when I worked there, and they look at that, and, they, they, and I guess rightfully so, think that that's the pinnacle of wrestling. Well, for me, it wasn't. I had been 
a, a huge star in Japan and had a great career in Japan. I had a, a good run in WCW with Marcus Bagwell when we were tag team champs there. And um, so I knew all these guys. Um, you know, we may not work for the same company, but our paths crossed at some point in time. So um, I um, appreciated what Jim did for me, believing in me. He was a tremendous ally, as was uh, Bruce and, uh, and JR as well. And this time when I did go to work for Vince, um, when I met with Vince, he made it very clear that, that uh, you know, if I did go to work there, that he probably wanted to do something different with me than the Patriot. Um, and he said, I just, honestly, in this day and age of wrestling, and now we're talking the late 90s, he said, I don't, I'm not convinced that a masked guy can really get over. And my argument to Vince was, well, Vince has gotten over all over the world. I've had a heck of a run for Mr. Bob in all Japan. Not too bad of a run in WCW, uh, so global. Wherever I've been, I've been one of the top baby faces in the company, one of the top guys in every company I've worked for. And I think it can get over. And he approached it with some skepticism, but after a couple of weeks of TVs and, and uh, seeing the reaction I got from the crowd when I would walk down that ramp and, and, and go through the curtain, he was then convinced that, yeah, this is a – pretty good character and we're going to leave it like it is and then decided to put me in that angle with Bret Hart because Bret had just turned heel and he was the um, he was the champ there he was still to the face of the company and it was perfect timing for Bret and I to, to, to pair up together and work that that angle with this flag waving guy from America this guy from Canada that's just putting the boots to our country and saying all the bad things about Americans and how horrible we were so it just fit like a glove and um we had a good run at it. And for me, the problem was, and it just ended up being the end of my career. When I got to Vince, I was, I was almost done. I was damaged goods when I got there, bro. I was put together with, you know, with, with, um, uh, string and, and bailing wire and, and pins and all parts of my body. I was, I was on borrowed time when I signed with Vince and I really did. I, I, I signed a three year deal when I signed with Vince and, uh, I tried to hide all that from Vince because I knew that the end was in sight, that physically I just couldn't continue. I had some major issues with injuries and had some major surgeries and was in, and I was in need of surgery on an elbow and a knee. And uh, I thought, man, if I can just make it through this through your contract, this is some extremely good money I can get here, and I'll just pack it in and walk away. And uh, I had no illusions of having a long run there because – I knew I was on borrowed time, and uh, and I did. I, I just physically could not continue to go, and uh, I just finally had to, along with my orthopedic surgeon and myself and Jr. and Vince, we had a conference call, and you know I was done. But uh, those, um, I appreciate Cornette. He he really did. He uh, he was a tremendous ally on my behalf, and and I still consider Jim a good friend. And you know Jim and I keep in contact and communicate with each other, but we're uh, two totally different people politically and what we believe Jim, you know, one way and I'm exactly the other way, but that's never hindered our friendship and nor his ability to, uh, to go to bat for me when I worked for Vince and, and was in the WWF at the time. So I'm very appreciative of Jim and Pritchard and, and JR and all those guys that, uh, it went to bat for me, and we're a big ally of the Patriots. And I know I discussed earlier, just uh, I don't want to go real deep into your wrestling career because I've already taken up a lot of your time as it is, and I would love to be able to speak with you again in more depth just about your wrestling career because you've told the story plenty of times. If folks are interested, there's more podcasts out there, like I said, where you really kind of get into the nitty-gritty, some of the things that you've alluded to. You go more into depth, and you know maybe if there's another opportunity, which I would absolutely love to speak with you, more about wrestling, um, just because there's a lot of questions that I have, too. But uh, sure. just just kind of to wrap up today, I do have some other just kind of smaller questions, just um, just kind of fun stuff that, I, that I've always wondered. So we talked earlier about the jobbers or the enhancers. Who would you say would be the top jobber? Because I have one in my head, but I would rather defer to the experts. When it comes to jobber or tag team jobbers, who would you put out there as probably the best of that particular style of wrestler? Well, I'm going to give you two. Now, there have been a couple of jobbers, I think, that were great characters, uh, personalities, um, uh, Iron Mike Sharp being one of them. But 
in doing their job and doing it properly and going out there to enhance that talent. Uh, the two best, in my opinion, are George South and Barry Horowitz. That's uh, actually going to kind of segue me. That's kind of interesting that you pull up George South because I actually had a chance to see him not too long ago. I want to say maybe a couple of months ago. I'm from Anderson, South Carolina. Yeah, that's my home base. So right. I'm not sure if you know where I'm going with this, but of course I've got a little, I might be a little biased, but I would probably say that my choice for top jobbers would have to be Bill and Randy Mulkey. Did you ever have a chance to do anything? I was going to say the Mulkey. <laughs> Did you ever have any interactions with those guys? I never have. Now, you know, we run into each other at these fan fest type deals uh, that, that I do and they do, but uh, I see them occasionally at, at those type of, of events. But as far as getting in the ring with them, to my knowledge, I don't think I ever had an opportunity to work with the Mulkey brothers. But, yeah, they were they were very good at what they did as well. And it's interesting because I, I was speaking just kind of back on Cornette, uh, one of the reasons why I really have a, a, an appreciation for him is is – when he actually put the Mulkies over when they won a match. And uh, I think it was the versus the Gladiators. I would have to go back and check that. But um, one of the guys under the mask for the Gladiators was actually George South, which was interesting because um, where I wanted to kind of go with this is I, I don't know, how much do you continue to keep up with wrestling these days? Is there is there a specific promotion that you continue to watch? Or are you just kind of a guy who catches it casually? Where are you at when it comes to wrestling these days? I'm a guy that catches it casually. I uh, I tune in uh, on Monday nights occasionally to watch some of the uh, product that Vince is putting out, and I'll tune in occasionally on Wednesdays to watch some AEW. Um, but and then, and then I'll go to some of the smaller events. Uh, last month I went down to an event in uh, Hanahan, South Carolina, and to see some of the guys that I knew that were going to be working. Some of the guys I know that were going to be working that show. But I would probably consider myself a little bit more of a casual fan now. And I know you and I have had a few interactions, um, and it's interesting that you bring up AEW. I'm I am not associated with any of these folks whatsoever. You know, not that I, there would ever be a reason for me to, but there has been times where I've said certain things, and folks have asked me, or well, you know, are you saying that because you're involved, or whatever the case is? So, and I know from your background, there's certain things you can and can't do depending upon the promotion that you're in. I'm actually a big AEW fan, and there's a lot of people out there who are very critical of it. Once again, I bring up Jim Cornette. He's very, very vocal, um, maybe not always positive about AEW and what they're doing, but I like it because it's fresh, and I want to throw another one out there. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to check it out. Billy Corgan, the um, lead singer of Smashing Pumpkins, has kind of rejuvenated the NWA wrestling, and they're doing it on a uh, YouTube mm-hmm. broadcast. Have you had a chance to check out the uh, NWA Power? I have. I've checked it out a couple of times, and, and I've enjoyed it. I've found it to be probably more suitable for me than the other two, the other two being Vince and AEW, because it's a little more old school, in my opinion. It's a little more of what, you know, what the business like was like when I was in the business, so I'm a little more appreciative of that. I uh, So I've checked it out a few times. Well, and, it's, um, and I will say that I'm a little partial to the uh, NWA power because I actually was able to attend the taping. That was uh, my Christmas gift to my nephew, who has since become a huge wrestling fan and asks me questions that I never even thought that I would need to delve into my <laughs> knowledge, if you want to say. But uh, I took him down for a taping, and I tell you what, it is absolutely top-notch. Once again, I'm not associated with the NWA power. I'm a Smashing Pumpkins fan. But as you stated, if you like the old school wrestling, if you are cool with watching something on YouTube, they do a great job of the broadcast. Um, I think we were there for about three hours. We got to watch an entire taping where they do three to four episodes. And that's where we got to see, you know, George South made an appearance to help put over some of the local talent. Uh, Nikita Koloff was there, um, which was interesting. That was one of my favorites, of course, growing up. So it's it's a lot of fun. I like these smaller promotions. And I guess just, to kind of start to wrap things up because you've uh, you've definitely been very generous with your time today from the Patriots himself as a wrestler. If I was able to talk to the Patriots, say in his heyday in the '90s, what would he say about wrestling today? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, somebody to tell you how how touchy this subject can be. I guess I would say there's some of it I like, and I appreciate every man and woman that's a part of that business that's traveling the roads night after night, getting in that ring. 
I've been there. I've done it. I know the sacrifice you make. I know what you put your body through. I'm living with it today, what you put your body through. And as you get older, it becomes even more of an effect on you, what you put your body through. I deal with it daily. So I appreciate every ounce of energy, effort that they put out there. But some of it is just plain garbage. I um, Somebody had put a little video uh, on Twitter last month of this orange Cassidy, <laughs> this cat walking around with his hands in his pocket. And I just retweeted it and made the comment, I'm so glad I retired before this garbage came along. And, bro, you'd have thought I'd have slipped somebody's mom of the tongue, <laughs> the way some of the uh, responses And I, I do have to and say uh, I took some heat on that one, too, because uh, I know from time to time I'll make a – because I know you wrestled Stan Hansen a good bit in your career. And, and yeah. from you, from Ron Simmons, I'm trying to think who else I've spoken to who have had a chance to, to, to face Stan Hansen. I mean, for the folks out there who say that wrestling is fake – who have that mentality. Um, I call it shallow. That's about as opinionated as I'm going to be as far as critical of folks. And it's funny that you bring that up because, you know, I reference Stan Hansen, you know, like, you know, imagine him, a guy like this Orange Cassidy, which, I mean, I I get the gimmick, I suppose. Um, I'm not a fan of it. I guess I understand it. Uh, as you stated, a lot of fans were very, very protective of him and, and it really got their personal feelings hurt. But, uh, you know, I did take some heat because I said, you know, imagine this guy taking a clothesline from Stan Hansen, and I just want everybody that uh, criti- was critical of me. I do know it was called the Lariat. But, uh, you know, and just in speaking to people, you know, because I remember speaking to Ron Simmons because, you know, he was teamed up with JBL, and you, you're talking about guys that give clotheslines. And yep. I, it may have been you who I made a reference to one time, and they said, no, no, no. You know, what he did was nothing compared to what Stan Hansen did. <laughs> no, that, that was, you've never taken a lariat or a clothesline until you've taken one from Hampton. And I learned early on after taking a couple from Stan that, that I needed to get as close to Stan's body as I could, because if I gave him a chance to extend that arm, he was going to take your head off. But if I sort of crowded him where he couldn't extend, uh, then I was going to be okay and take more of a shoulder tackle. But, no, there's nobody that's ever thrown it. JBL had a good one, but nobody has ever thrown a clothesline like that. And I Hansen. think the other thing that I heard, too, was someone said, you better stand on your tiptoes, otherwise he's going to take your uh, throat out. <laughs> so that was the uh, – well, that was something else I heard. And he couldn't, he couldn't see very well. And he was truly a bull in a china shop kind of guy. Stan's a great guy, and he's easy to work with. I've never had a problem with Stan. But, you know, that clothesline's a real deal, brother. It's his finish. And the guy protects his finish. I mean, that's who he is. That, that's what he makes his living with. And it's got to be believable. It's got to – people believe in Stan Hansen's clothesline, and rightfully so, because he did it the right way. He gave it the right way. He executed it the right way. And uh, it's got to be believable. And uh, there's nothing more believable. Than, and and I'm, I'm probably off on a tangent here, too, but – I can honestly say I don't think I've ever been around anyone, and I traveled with Stan for years. We were in Japan together. I don't think I've ever been around anyone that protected his image as good as Stan did. When we were traveling in Japan and uh, we went into a restaurant to eat or we went into a gym to work out, if a wrestling fan came up with a card and wanted it signed, it got ripped into pieces. If they had a camera, I've seen him take cameras and stomp them. So he lived that character outside the ring. So when they paid their hard-earned money to go watch him in person, that guy they encountered at the Noodle House six weeks ago was that same guy that's taking somebody's head off in the ring, and they believed him. They believed in him. And, they believed in and him. And that's so. one of those conversations definitely for a different day because I'm always interested. I've uh, I've had a chance once again, and you know I don't I don't mean to toot my own horn because goodness I've you know maybe spoken to a handful of of former professional wrestlers, which is nowhere near what you have, but, you know, they, everybody seems to be personally, uh, uh, there seems to be a line with some of these guys that are what I would consider to be more of the classical style wrestlers with the whole idea that, uh, you know, that kayfabe has essentially, uh, essentially been destroyed. But um, I do see a couple of wrestlers who still maintain. Um, I know uh, MJF on the AEW production. I have a feeling he, I mean, he's already a big star. But uh, my nephew was able to go on the Chris Jericho cruise, and he said that MJF never 
once broke character on that entire cruise, which was, I think, three to four days long. And, you know, and it's just interesting to see that there's guys that still subscribe to that, which I, you know, that's one of the things that I, I, I enjoyed because, you know, I, I know my sister grew up hating Ric Flair because the time that she met him, he was rude, and nasty to her, but he was in character. So it wasn't just a rude, nasty sure. from whatever. So, and I, and I encourage anybody who's maybe not a wrestling fan to just understand what it is. You know, it's it, it, anybody can go out and watch a movie and be completely enveloped by the movie people can go to the theater go to a musical whatever the case is and you're able to just you know to suspend belief but you know when you're looking at something like what you guys were doing there's a lot of planning a lot of training that goes into it i've been able to go backstage before match and see two guys who come from two different promotions who literally have five minutes to plan what they're about to go out and do and they're slated to go 30 minutes so you know it's yep. it there's definitely a lot of uh, a lot going on and and, and I appreciate it. I hope that a lot of folks will kind of gain an appreciation. It's not for everybody. <laughs> well, let me let me share this with you, and and, and I'll I'll be sure. brief about it. Uh, uh, do you remember? Are you familiar with the destroyer? Yes, Dick sir. Died yes, last sir. Year? I got I had the privilege of working with Dick in Japan, and and uh, he was a huge star. A lot of wrestling fans today may not even know that the man ever existed, but he was a big star. At one time, and Bob was, uh, was a very loyal man, and guys that had ever made him money, even to, into their 50s and 60s, Bob would bring them back and put them on a tour or two a year when I worked for All Japan. And this was Dick Bio, the Destroyer. I've gone to work out with him. I've gone to a movie with him in Japan. I've gone to eat with him. He wore his mask everywhere. He never broke character. And while we got along, and he liked me, and I liked him, and he respected me, he thought that I was doing a disservice to the business because I would not go out in public with my mask on. Now, I wore it into the building, and I wore it when I left the building. Get a block or two close to the building, I put my mask on, and I wait till I'm a block or two away from the building, and I take it off. But Dick, he performed life with his mask on everywhere he went. He went to a Super Bowl. He showed me a picture. He was a huge Bills fan. And he went to one of the Super Bowls the Bills was in, and he had his mask on at the Super Bowl. He lived the Destroyer. It was who he was. It fed his family. It put his kids through college. It did everything for him. So he never broke character. And you go eat with Dick, and you went with a guy that wore a mask. So I appreciate hey, that. That's, um, and it's always fun to hear stories like that. I had a chance to go here recently. Um, Jake the Snake was actually in Columbia not too long ago. Um, where he did kind of a session at a comedy club. And, and just to hear the stories from, from guys like Jake the Snake, um, and, you know, you definitely have more of a story than we told today. But to hear what you guys have dealt with in your personal lives outside of the spotlight, outside of the ring, the things that you deal with so that you can do, you know, what fans show up to see. A lot of times they don't know what you're dealing with behind the scenes. And, you know, I know your story. I encourage folks to... Check it out if they haven't um, already. They can go to your website, which I have been meaning to do a plug for, and I apologize that it's taken this long to get there. But you do have a, web, a website that you spoke about, DellThePatriotWilks.com. Um, I know you have some information on there. Folks can contact you. Folks can follow you on Twitter. Um, you're pretty active on Twitter, so a lot of folks can kind of keep up with you there as well. Um, you have a lot to offer, photos, toys, videos. I know you have a DVD that came out not too long ago that talks a lot about your your wrestling career. It's a lot of good stuff on there. I need to get on there and order some stuff because I've been meaning to. You know, Other than that, I just want to say thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been very, very informative. I'd love to speak to you again at some point. I'll give you a chance to kind of recover from all of my questions. But outside of that, if there's anything else you'd like to add, by all means, feel free, sir. Well, I think you've covered it, and I appreciate you plugging the website. And yeah, and and, and I think we're very reasonable with with all our merchandise on there uh, at a very reasonable price, and it's all autographed. And like you said, everything from pictures, cards, masks, T-shirts, DVDs. Um, I think the guy that runs the website for me also keeps uh, uh, the dates on there where I'm going to be. Uh, making appearances and doing personal appearances and fan fest type events. And uh, yeah, man, I appreciate it. I appreciate you calling me and able to get together and do this. And, and yeah, let's do it another time and we can talk more wrestling. I guess for anybody else out there, um, are you still actively selling cars outside of the whole coronavirus issues? 
Yeah, we're, we're, right now things are slow, and understandably so, but I've been at Dick Smith Nissan on uh, Fernandina Road for uh, July will be 15 years, and it's been a wonderful second career for me. And uh, so I'm there, and I still do a lot of the fan fest events and personal, you know, personal appearances and things like that. So we certainly have plenty to keep us busy. There's some folks out there who are thinking about getting a new car. There you go. There's your opportunity to kind of help out a fellow Gamecock slash wrestler, performer, whatever you want. But, uh, hey, go check it out because I'm sure you'll probably be more than willing to help some folks out when it comes time for a new car as well. But, Absolutely. Um, other than that, thank you again, sir. I greatly appreciate your time, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Thanks, man. Have a good afternoon.